Turn with me in your Bibles, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We're going to close out chapter 1 today. As you're turning there, I want to ask you a question. Have you ever been completely amazed by something? I'm not talking, yeah, that was kind of neat. I'm talking completely and utterly blown away. Maybe you were at a, a circus. I was at a circus one time, and I saw the, uh, the guys flying through the air, and, and, and they were doing some amazing things that I thought, that's just crazy. And then they took the net away, and they continued to do it. And then one guy put bl uh, a blindfold on, and I was just completely amazed. It was, it was shocking. So I want you to think about that for a moment. Have you ever been completely amazed by something? That's kind of where we are today in the scriptures. It never ceases to amaze me how God works in the lives and the hearts of his people and in some totally unexpected ways. As a matter of fact, Isaiah pondered these very same thoughts uh, when he wrote about the Lord in Isaiah 55, beginning of verse 8. It says this, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. We just don't think the same way God does. We just don't do things the same way that the Lord does. He has ways of working in our lives that are totally and completely unexpected. And it makes sense because uh, he has unlimited resources, unlimited knowledge, unlimited creativity, and unlimited power. He can literally do whatever he chooses. And that puts him on a completely, it's even, it even feels uh, um, small to say he's on a different level than we are. Because we can't even compare to the least of what God is able to do. He meets our needs in some unexpected ways when we face unexpected burdens or even when we have unexpected blessings, blessings and battles in life. Sometimes we just don't know what to do. Have you ever faced something and you, you're completely clueless? as to how to go through it. Something's in front of you, something, you're, you're about to do something, or, or, and you think, I, ju I just don't know what to do. I don't even know how to begin. A lot of times we face these situations. Kind of like Israel at the, uh, when they kind of, they came up to the Red Sea. Remember what happened. Remember, uh, you have Pharaoh's army. Now at that time, Pharaoh, uh, Egypt, his army, they were the pinnacle of society. And here's a bunch of former slaves, no weapons, no boats, no resources. Uh, they're up against the river, and behind them is Pharaoh and his entire army. What do you do? You can't swim across. You can't turn back and fight the army. What do you do? So God, who would have thought that God would have split the water and let them walk across on dry land? Amazing, completely and utterly amazing. The Lord is always full of surprises. Isaiah 43, 19 says this, Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Ye shall not know it. I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. God says, you know what? Whatever's going on in your life right now, whatever you're facing right now, I'm going to do a new thing in it. You may not know what to do. You may not know what path to take. But God says, I do. God says, I can totally destroy the box that you've put yourself and me in and do things that are beyond your wildest imagination and expectation. Uh, there, no doubt, are stories that all of us can share about how God has provided in completely unexpected ways. Thirteen years ago, Angela and I took our kids and we moved here to Pennsylvania to serve the Lord. We had previously been serving him in Massachusetts at a church that we loved and they loved us and, and it was, everything was good, and, uh, but we, f we were sure that God wanted us here. So we came. Uh, we only had a little bit of money, a little bit of resources, but we had enough to buy a small piece of land and build a house on that land. Well, there were problems in the building process, as usually there are, and we were left with a half-finished home, <laughs> very limited resources, 
And honestly, I didn't know what to do. Now, like most guys, I'm a fixer, and I want to say, I want to figure out ways. Of, I had no idea what to do. God provided ways to make a little bit of money to, so that we could finish the home, and, and we got it livable, and it was very exciting. And we got in there, we got all our stuff in, and we live. And then our first mortgage payment came up. My first mortgage payment ever. I had never owned a house before that. And here was the problem. We literally had $37 in our bank account. And our, our mortgage payment was in five days. And I'm thinking, this is great. I finally got a house, and I can't make my first mortgage payment. So, you know, I, I was, I remember this, it was five days before, and I'm, I was walking to the mailbox for more bad news. You know what that means, it's bills. Bad news is spelled B-I-L-L-S, right? And so, and I'm walking there, and, and I remember I was praying, and, and I, I thought, I said, I said, Lord, you called us here, and I love you, and I'm going to serve you no matter what. In fact, Angela and I, on the way out here in, in the, the moving uh, vehicle, we talked about, we said, whatever God's going to do, we're going to serve him. So I'm walking to the mailbox to get the bills that I can't pay along with my mortgage payment in five days that I can't pay. And I said, Lord, we can't, uh, we're going to serve you no matter what, but can you, can you send some help, please? Got to the mailbox, opened it up. There was one letter in there. There was no return address on it. It was just one envelope from, there was a, there was a stamp on it and, and our address. I opened it up. There was an anonymous banker's check for the exact amount to the penny for our mortgage payment, our first mortgage payment. Never knew where it came from. Yeah. <laughs> completely, completely unexpected way God provided. I, I didn't know what to do. God said, I got this. And he did. <laughs> and, and it was truly, truly amazing. It kind of brings to light what we read in Philippians 4.19 where it says, My God shall supply all your need according to what? This is the part about it. The, you know, we usually look, focus on he'll supply all our need. And that's good. But I really like the second part. According to his riches. According to his bank account. So if I came up to you, if I said, uh, if I came up to, to Scott, Scott needs some money. And I say, Scott, I'm going to help you out. Okay. And Scott says, okay, well, I need X amount of dollars. I'm going to say, well, all I have is this. God doesn't have that limit. He says, what do you need? I can, I can, I can over abundantly take care of that. And, and that's what we see all throughout Scripture. When we look at Scripture, we find God providing in unexpected ways, like when he protected baby Moses. Now, uh, Moses' mom, Jochebed, she uh, was expecting to merely survive. God had other plans. God took and brought that baby literally to the to princess of Egypt, to Pharaoh's own daughter, who should have just dunked a child and got, it was a Hebrew child. They were, they were killing the Hebrew children. But no, she took it and took Moses and made her, and he was raised up in the palace of Egypt. Incredible. Uh, Elijah God used ravens as waitresses to feed Elijah during a famine and during uh, a crop failure. Okay, there was a drought and a famine. Elijah was just expect he was expecting to, to, to starve to death. God had another plan. The widow at Zarephath was scraping the, literally scraping the bottom of the barrel. She got her last little bit of grain, her last little bit of food to feed herself and her child expecting to now die. But God had another plan. God sent Elijah and miraculously provided for her needs for the rest of her life. All these people were expecting something, but God had a different plan. So my question, my first question to us this morning is, what are you expecting? What are you expecting the Lord to do in your life? How are you expecting God to use you in the lives of the people around you? What are you expecting God to do with your life that's going to bring glory to him? Chances are, chances are, God has another plan. Chances are. Because God has a way of doing things unexpected in his own time and in his own way. The beauty about 
This is, we don't tell God how to work our lives. We just surrender to what he's doing. And that's really good because I've had some plans that I wanted God to take care of. I drew them up, gave them to him. I said, God, this is what I want to do. This is what I want. And he's like, no, that, that's, that's very interesting. I got something else for you. And it was far better. And I thought, afterwards, I go, thank you, Lord, for taking care of that and wiping my plan out because his plan is always so much better. And that's where we find ourselves on our journey through 1 Corinthians. Our lives with the Lord become a series of unexpected adventures, amazing discoveries, and epic journeys. So please turn. We're already in 1 Corinthians. We're going to start off. We're going to end. Start off where we ended last week with verse 24 and get into 25. It says, uh, uh, we read where it says here. There we go. Uh, but unto them which are called, both Jews and Greek. So that pretty much covers the entire world. There were either Jews or Greeks. There was either Jews or Gentiles. That's how the world was back then, okay? Uh, both Jews and, uh, and Greeks. Uh, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. So that's where we left off last week. But take a look at this. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. So our first main point today is this. How big is God in your eyes? We typically compare God to things that we know. Usually ourselves. Usually we think, I can do this, I can do that, people around me, this is normal. Okay, God, you're a little bit better than that, so we're going to trust in you because you're a little bit better than... That's not what we're seeing here. <laughs> Paul stretches, stresses the huge difference between us and the Lord. Paul says, if, if God could have any foolishness at all, the least of his wisdom is infinitely greater than the wisest of people. If God could possibly have any kind of weakness, his, his, the, the very weakest of God is infinitely greater than the most powerful of humans. <laughs> There is no comparison between the abilities of God and the abilities of human. All come short of his glory. All come short of, of who he is. And I want you to understand this. Get this point. God has no limits. D d d d I need you to get that. Okay? You can fall asleep for a little bit in between this and the next point. But I need you to get this. God has no limits. Say it with me. God has no limits. Now we say that. And probably on some level we believe it. But I doubt if we truly comprehend it. Because everything that we know in life has limits, right? So why do people struggle so much with God? If he has no limits, and he demonstrated that throughout history, why? Well, people's pride uh, tends to cause them to reason God's existence out of their lives. We think we're really smart. Now, there are some smart people in this world, but the smartest of them are complete and utter idiots compared to the least of what God could possibly produce. And, and these people, and, and I was there, uh, and probably a lot of you were, before I knew God in a, on a personal level, I, before he came into my life and saved me, I thought I was pretty smart. I thought I knew more than everybody else, including God. And, and you know, we tend to, tend to uh, um, not really expect God to do anything in our lives. We kind of, we spend some time, uh, we don't want to, we don't want to consider God. And, and those that are, are wise in this world, they say it's a waste of time to go down that road. And we see it in our colleges around the world. We see it everywhere. People think that they're pretty smart. My friends, at our best, at our very best, we are small and weak compared to God. At our very best. Compared to the almighty God, he simply has what? No limits. I mean, zero limits. <laughs> if you were to combine, in fact, all the power in the entire universe, I mean every single bit of it, and put it all together, you would have an immense amount of power. 
I mean, think about that. You talk about the entire universe, every living creature, every molecule, every atom with a, the with a nuclear power stored, every single bit of power in the entire universe, and put it all together, you would have an immense amount of power. But it's at that point that God's power is just beginning. He's so much greater. He's, so, he's infinitely greater than even all of that. He has no limits. And one day, everybody, including the doubters, are going to recognize this. And we see that in Philippians 2. It says, Wherefore, God also hath exo highly exalted him, talking about Christ, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, how many knees are going to bow? How many? Does that mean um, Einstein's knee will bow? Yeah. Does that mean uh, Hawking's knee will bow? My knees, your knees, every knee. That Greek word literally means every. It's everything. There's nothing, nothing outside of it, okay? Every knee should bow of things. Here, now, here's, where, here's how all-encompassing it is. Things in heaven, that means all the angelic beings. And things in the earth, all humans, all animals. Imagine when that day comes and we're all on our knees before the Lord and all the created beings in all existence are also on their knees before the Lord. Horses and elephants and uh, crocodiles. Do crocodiles have knees? If they do, they are going to be bent. Okay? I should have picked another animal, one that I was sure about. I, I could have said snake, though, right? <laughs> They're going to be in the dust still. Okay? Um, in, things in heaven, things in the earth, things under the earth. No, we're not talking about just worms. We're talking about more of a, a, a spiritual level. Even the dead. Even the demons, even the devil himself is going to be on his knees before Jesus Christ. Everyone. And that every tongue should confess. I love this part. Because there are a lot of people, a lot of humans that want to uh, build ourselves up and make ourselves into something special. And, and we get that from our father, our first father, the devil. Okay? And who said, I will be like the Most High. Well, the day is going to come when he's going to be on his knees and say, no, you are. Every tongue, every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is what? A prophet? A great guy? A religious leader? An amazing man? No, that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let me assure you of, of, of three uh, undeniable facts today. Number one, the Lord is wiser than you are. If that has come to, if that's a surprise to you, we got, some, we got some work to do. If you came here and didn't know that, see me after the service. We'll spend some time showing you just how smart God is compared to, to you. He has an infinite IQ. I heard this, this statement uh, one time, and it blew me away. Has it ever occurred to you that nothing has ever occurred to God? What does that mean? God doesn't learn anything. God is the only being in all existence that cannot learn a single thing. Why? Because he already knows every single thing. If you wake up tomorrow and you come up with this, this revolutionary, creative, intuitive idea, God's going to look at it and say, good job. Yeah, I already knew about that. Yeah, I know. Sometimes our kids will do that, right? You'll say something and say, I know. Yeah, I know. God can say that. <laughs> whatever we say, whatever comes into existence, yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. Not only is he wiser than you are, but the Lord is more powerful than you are. That's why he's called the Almighty. There can only be one. There can only be one Almighty. What happens if there are two Almighties? You got to use a different word. There can only be one Almighty. You got to use a different word. And Almighty is only used for who? Jesus Christ, the Lord of heaven and earth. The Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending, the creator of everything. He is the only one that can have this title, Almighty. Nothing is harder for him than anything else. And, and you know, lifting a pen, God, is no different than starting the earth to spin, power-wise. It's no different than, than raising a mountain. It's no different than holding the universe in his hand. Why? Because he has no limits. We don't get to the end of his power. We don't, get, we don't say, okay, wow, God only used 
0.000001% uh, of his power to lift the pen, but he put, used 0 0.005 to spin the air. No, you can't even say how much power, because he has no limits. He has no limits. That makes him a lot more powerful than we are. Here's one that everybody doesn't like. The Lord is better than you are. There's no evil in him whatsoever, no darkness, no cruelty, no sin, no flaws at all. You know, Mary Poppins can claim to be practically perfect in every way, but God says, I'm perfectly perfect in every way. He even beats out Mary Poppins, which, yeah, some of you are like, what? Yes, he even beats out Mary Poppins. He is perfectly perfect in every single way. No darkness. Think about that. Think about how many years you and I spend trying to draw closer to the Lord, trying to be pleasing to Him, trying to walk holy lives, and, and you know, we, we do move forward, we do get better, we do sin less than we did, but we can never begin to reach perfection. Does it mean that we quit trying? No, we always strive. But God, it's who he is. We strive for perfection. We strive for holiness. We strive for sanctification. And it's just who God is. I mean, think about that. He didn't have to try to be holy. He is holy. He's the definition of holiness. God is just wiser, more powerful, and better than we are. With that said, why in the world would we look anywhere else for guidance through trials, deliverance through troubles, and comfort in turmoil? First point, please get, wrap your mind around this. God has no limits at all. Yet, yet, that's just the first verse. Yet, he chooses to engage very limited people in his plan, in his will. Think about that for a second. You got God who is unlimited. Now, so let's, let's, let's map this out. If God chose to right now, could he create a perfect being that has immense, smarter than any human who ever lived, stronger than any human who ever lived, and better than any human ever lived? Could God do that right now, like with the blink of an eye? Yes, remember, God has no limits. He could, but does he? I haven't seen him do it yet. Instead, he's created us, who are not as smart as God, not as powerful as God, and not as good as God. Yet he chose, chooses to use us in his perfect plan. What in the world is that all about? Well, take a look. Beginning in verse 26, it says, For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen, what? The foolish things of this world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of this world to confound the things which are mighty. Verse 28. And base things of this world, things which are despised, hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring to naught the things that are. What is he saying? Here's a life-changing truth for you. If you get this, the first part is God has no limit. Literally none. So why would he use us? This is a life-changing truth. God is not looking for perfect people. He's simply looking for people he can work perfectly in and through. Now, why is that so important today? Why does that matter today? Well, it matters as much today as it always has. Look at some of the people that God has used to mold this world, to change the course of human history. Jacob was a deceiver. Peter was a hothead. David was a cheater. Noah was a drunk. Or got drunk. Jonah ran away from God, the opposite direction. God said, Jonah, go there and, and reach those people. You're going to do a mighty thing. He's like, nope, and ran the other way. Paul was a murderer. Gideon was afraid. I, I love the story of Gideon. 
the angel comes to him and says, so Gideon's shaking, he's hiding behind a threshing thing, and the angel comes, comes and says, oh, thou mighty man of God, as he's, you know, like a little rabbit. He was afraid. How about Miriam? Miriam was a gossip. Martha was anxious. Thomas was a doubter. Elijah was depressed. Moses had a speech impediment. Abraham and Sarah were too old. Lazarus was too dead. I mean, he was about as dead as you get. Four days in the grave. His sister, in a loving way, said, Lord, don't move that stone away. He stinketh by this point. Yet God used every single one of them and more to accomplish his divine plan and shape for this world. You see, God's criteria for world changers who will do his will and, and perform his plan is different than expected. People tend to look for the smartest or the strongest or the most capable to, to complete a task. God, however, has a different and unexpected set of criteria. So many of you, you hire people in your company to, to, to work in your company. I doubt if you have, you know, here's the interview process and the person comes there and says, hey, are you like the least of the least? Because that's what I'm looking for to do this job. Are you completely inept? Because I really need that kind of guy. Are you, are you like, you know, on the struggle bus 90% of the time? Because that's the kind of girl that I need right now. Oh, you got a fancy degree from a fancy college and you accomplish a lot of things and you're a superstar. I'm sorry, we can't use you today. <laughs> Bye-bye. No, we don't do that. We look for the best of the best, right? That's, that's who we are. God has a completely different set of qualifications. The God that we're talking about is the God that picked David instead of his brother, Eliab. You think about that. His older brother was older. He was more handsome, stronger, and far better equipped to become king. And God said, well, let's take a look. I don't want to put words in his mouth. He says, and it came to pass when they were come, meaning the, the, the children. So he had, he had uh, uh, Jesse had a, a bunch of sons. And, and they came, and he looked at, so Samuel's looking at uh, Eliab. And he said, surely the, the Lord's anointed is, is before him. Eliab fell into the same problem, Rick, that you fall into when you're looking for somebody to work for you. You're not saying, where's the garbage? I need the garbage. You're like, oh, okay, who's the good guy? Who's the guy that's going to fit this? Legitimate. That's what Samuel, he, Samuel wasn't sinning here. Samuel was just doing what Samuel knew how to do. He said, surely, look at this guy. He's strong. He's big. He's handsome. He is capable. This has got to be the man that God wants to be king of his people. Look at the first word in verse 7. But, but, the Lord said unto Samuel, look not on his countenance on the outside, right? on the height of his statue, because I have refused him. He's like, he's like, yeah, Eliab's a great guy. I don't want him. Not for this job. He had other jobs for Eliab, but not for this one. Not to be king of his people. For the Lord sees not as a man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. <laughs> Paul made it clear that not many folks who are wise, mighty, or noble are called by God to do his will. Men who are filled with worldly wisdom tend to, tend to be full of themselves. And, and, and their reasoning gets in the way of trusting God. Now, I'm not saying, you know, that God only uses uneducated people. We know that's not true. I mean, he used Moses, he used Deborah, Luke, Lydia, Paul, all extremely educated people. But they were different in that they were not prideful in their intellect. They reached for something greater. So you may be here today, you may be thinking, I'm really not the sharpest tool in the shed. I don't have a bunch of degrees after my name. God says, okay, we can work with that. Now, if you do have a bunch of degrees behind your name, God says, we can work with that too, but he's going to look at your heart, not your degrees. He's not going to look at the piece of paper. He's going to look at your heart. That's what he's looking for. He says that he doesn't use many mighty the word mighty comes from the word uh, dunatos, okay? And it means mighty in wealth and influence. And this would describe the, the religious elite of the day, uh, the politicians of the day, what you would consider celebrities of the day. 
Not many of them are, are called because they were entangled in social affairs. You got one group's entangled with the intellectual affairs. You got one group entangled in the social affairs, and they're, and that, they're all about that. And God says, yeah, you may be a big shot to everybody around you, but to me, you're still a little shot, and I, I, I'm looking for somebody else. I'm looking for somebody else. Can he still use that person? He will, because God's plan is far greater than ours. But when he's looking for, when he's looking for people to be a world changer, to make an impact in lives for his kingdom, he's not necessarily looking for the guy with five doctorate degrees or the guy that is, or the girl that is, uh, has the most uh, um, t- Twitter, tweety, Twitters, uh, connections or people, followers, right? Is that right? Followers. Not necessarily looking for the person with the uh, Golden Globe Award or the whatever. He's, he's looking for people. He doesn't call them mighty or noble men. Those of noble birth. He's referring to those that are from the aristocracy. You know, they say, well, this person's from the aristocracy. This person's royalty. Surely God can use that person. Mm. He can, but he's not looking for those kind of people. Paul says that intellectual, political, and social position are not necessary qualifications for being chosen by God to do his will. God has uh, uh, unexpected ways of using ordinary people to perform extraordinary deeds for him. Final one that he uses here is base. God chooses the base things. That comes from a, a, a word that means common, ordinary stock, not aristocracy. Here's the question. Why? Why would God, who has access to the great resources of the world, Why would God, who is perfectly perfect in every way, choose common, ordinary, non-royal people to be the world changers? Why would he do that? Why would he use a slave and a prisoner in a foreign land to rescue two nations from starvation? Let's do a test. Who am I talking about? Joseph. He used a slave and a prisoner to rescue two nations entire nations. <laughs> okay, get this one ready. This one will be easier because we talked about it already. Why would, God, why would God use an old outcast and murderer after 40 years of tending sheep in the desert to deliver people from 400 years of Egyptian bondage? Who was that? Moses. Why would he use that guy? I mean, to that point, Moses had pretty much failed in every single thing possible except he was okay with sheep. Think about that. He couldn't handle it in Egypt. He couldn't handle it in the wilderness by himself. He needed rescued. And what did God say? Hey, I'm going to use you to to deliver my people. Really? Really, Lord? That's that's the best choice you can make? Obviously it was. (laughs) Hey, how about this person? Why would God use 300 people with trumpets and torches to defeat the 185,000-man army of the Midianites? Who is that? Gideon. 300 people! And he didn't even use their incredible fighting ability. He said, can you blow a horn, and can you break a bottle, a, 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 a container that has a light in it? Yeah? Okay, you're mine. Now we're going to wipe out, so 300, now we're going to wipe out the evil enemy of 185,000. Why would he do that? Why would God use a shepherd boy to defeat a giant while an entire army stood frozen in fear behind him and turn that same boy into, into king of his people? That's David. We talked about him. Why would he turn a young slave girl into a queen who would save an entire nation from genocide? Who, who are we talking about? Esther. Why would he use her? She was the least of the least. The only thing she had going for her was she was kind of cute. That's it. She was kind of cute. And God used her to save an entire nation. Why would God use a common teenage girl to become the mother of the Messiah? Why would he do that? Joseph and Mary had nothing. They had less than nothing because of the stigma that came with Mary being pregnant before their wedding. 
Why would God do that? Well, let's take a look at verses 29 to 30, 31. So he uses the people, not many wise, not many powerful, not many, uh, uh, but he uses the base. Why? So that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. All the things that he said that he doesn't call for in people, he uses because of who he is. That according as it is written, he that glorifies, so you want to glory? Okay, you can glory. You want to puff up your chest? You want to, you want to, you want to uh, crow? You want to talk big stuff? Go right ahead. But let him glory in the Lord. Let him glory in the Lord. If I walk around saying how great I am and how many accomplishments I have and how many this I have, and, I, and, and that's not going to get me very far. But if I want to walk around and, and tell people how great my God is, how great my king is, one, I have a couple of legs to stand on. Two, I'm doing what he told me to do. And I suspect that the reason God doesn't use the cream of the crop, but he uses ordinary people, is so that glory goes to him and not us. So if somebody ever wants to give you some glory, be very careful, because you don't deserve it. If you've accomplished something for God in your life, don't publish it. Don't, you know, try to get a lot of accolades. Don't you? Remember who it was that did it through you. And then maybe God will use you again and again and again. Why doesn't he use the elite? Why doesn't he use royalty? I think because he wants to turn us into it. John 1.12, but as many as received him to them gave you power to become the children of God. Even to them that believe on his name. God is the king of kings and lord of lords, yes? How many of you agree with that, yes? No doubt, unequivocally, king of kings, lord and lord, lord of lords, lord of lords. And he wants to use you, but not just use you, he wants to make you his son and daughter. What does that make you? That makes you royalty, not because of who you are. You see, a prince and a princess isn't a prince and a princess because they're spectacular. They're a prince and a princess because their father is the king. You, you get that? That's the only reason why they are royalty is because their father is the king. Well, who's your father? Who's your father? According to this, if we trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, he becomes our father. And he brings us into his royal family where we can now give glory to him for everything that is accomplished in our lives. You see, when you can know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, your life is just beginning. Your life for heaven is just beginning. Your glorying and, and the accomplishments that God is able to do in and through you is just beginning. And you and I can give glory to God in the midst of that. He calls us to show the world who he is. Take a look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. It says, you are a chosen generation. Now, I want to stop there just for a second. If you're like 99.9% .9 of the people in the world, you have doubted yourself. You have felt inadequate in some way, shape, or form in your life. You have struggled with something that has kind of made you feel a little less. Now, it may represent itself as uh, uh, incredible pride. Say, so, well, I've got to make everything else look better. I've got to make myself look like a big shot because of that. But chances are, if you're like 99.9% .9 of the people on this planet who ever live, you have at one time or another felt less, felt unworthy, felt small, insignificant. But look at this. You're the one God chose. You're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. That you, why? 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 Why all of this? That you should show forth the praise of Him who hath called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. You see, the disciples that followed the Lord were simply men and women who loved Jesus. That was the criteria. That's what God was looking for. He was looking for humble hearts, looking for ordinary people that he could use to do extraordinary things. And he did. 
this group of ragtag guys and girls turned the world upside down against the most powerful nation, militarily speaking, that ever existed to that point. Rome blew everybody out of the water. And God said, I'm going to use you to change the entire Roman world. Us? Yeah. Because he is great, and he is majestic, and he has no limits. And he, if we are surrendered, if we are humble, and we say, Lord, here am I, use me. Remember, remember Isaiah? Lord, here am I, use me. God said, who am I going to send? Who are we going to send? Because he's talking from the from tri, uh, Trinity standpoint. Who are we going to send? Who's going to go for us? And, and, and he humbly says, Lord, send, here I am, send me. I'm a nobody. He was down on his face before the Lord. Read, read Isaiah chapter 6 when you get a chance. It's mind-boggling what takes place. Isaiah is in the presence of God himself. And he realizes, oh, oh, that you're infinitely greater than I thought you were. And he's down on his face before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And what happens next is mind-boggling. This God, this creator says, who am I going to send? And he says, here am I, send me. And then God made him worthy. Then God took uh, a coal from the altar and, and had an angel take a coal from the altar and touch it. a picture of Jesus Christ dying on the cross for us. And then Isaiah was able to go out and then Isaiah was able to accomplish things for the Lord. You know what that picture is a picture of? Every single one of us who surrenders our, our own pride, who, who turn from our sins and turn to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. It's every one of us. It's a picture of you and me. Read, read Isaiah chapter 6 this week. First eight or so verses. Read them. That's a picture. It's not you. Don't put your name there. I, I, don't, I don't get into that, putting your name in. He's talking Isaiah. But it's a picture of what he does with you and with me through Jesus Christ. God did not... Look for the cream of the crop, the big shots. They were not wealthy, but they were willing. They were not prideful, they were humble. And God took them and changed everything. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes just for a moment. Here we are in a very, very, I don't know, a very mixed up, twisted, broken world. And sometimes we just don't know what to do. Sometimes we don't know how to proceed. We get uh, all kinds of information from all different kinds of sources, media and social media and everything, everything under the sun about everything. And there's so much information, it's information overload we don't know what to do. And then God, from his throne, says, you don't know what to do? How about you just trust me? Because I have no limits. And I'm looking for somebody just like you to work through. Are you willing? Are you humble? Are you ready to just say, Lord, here am I, use me? If you are, you are a prime candidate for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords to change the world around you. Maybe you're here today, maybe you don't know Jesus, Lord and Savior. Maybe you're here today and you think, yeah, you know what? I, I, I am useless. I am worthless. I have no value. I got news for you. The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords thinks so much of you that he went to the cross and died just to save you. So whatever you think of yourself, that's going to take a little while to change. I understand. Some of us have spent a lot of years being told that we're not worth a whole lot. But know this. God thinks differently than we do. God does things differently than we do. And he looks at you with love that is beyond our wildest imagination. He says, I will save you. And I will use you for my work. And I will change the world through someone like you. So if you're here today, you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, but God has spoken to you some, at some point today. You can respond. You can call back to him. You can, you can reach out. It's not anything that you can do. You didn't do any of the work. God did it all. Remember, he had no limits, but we are very limited. 
but he does give us the opportunity to respond to what he did. And if that's you, and you want to know the Lord as Savior, you want to know that you have a home in heaven, you want to know that you have a, a, a divine purpose here on earth, you can pray. My Bible says, if you call upon the name of the Lord, you shall be saved. Jesus is the only way to heaven. So what are you going to do with Jesus? When you stand before heaven, before God on the throne, he's going to ask you that question. What have you done with my son Jesus? If you say, well, I admired him. He was a great guy, and I studied about him. I went to church for years, and I know a lot about him. I can give you a lot of facts and figures. He's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. But if you can look him in the eye, which I don't know if we'll actually do that. I think we're going to be on our face groveling before him. But if you can say, I surrendered. And I placed my faith, my hope, and my trust in him for my salvation. God's going to welcome you and me into heaven. And if you have not done that, you could do it right now. Right where you are, quiet to yourself. Whether you're here or whether you're watching online, if you have not trusted in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I'm not talking about religion. I'm not talking about church. I'm not talking about doing a bunch of great things. I'm talking about trusting in Jesus and Jesus alone for heaven. If you have not done that, you could do it right now. If he's called you, if he's spoken to you, you can answer back. And you could say something so simple, something like this. You could say, Lord, I am unworthy. I have sinned. And I am truly sorry. I repent, Lord. I repent. I turn from it. And I turn to you. And as best as I know how, right now, this moment, I place my faith, my hope, and my trust in your risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, if someone has called upon your name today, Lord, I ask that you would make your presence known to them in a very powerful way. For those of us that have called upon you, Lord, maybe we're not thinking very highly of ourselves. That's probably not a bad place to be, a humble place to be. It's probably very good. But sometimes that can go to a point where we don't think we can do anything for your kingdom. Help us to understand, Lord, that you have no limits and you can work through us and use us for your glory, honor, and praise. And that's what we ask for today, Lord. Please, use us. Here we are, Lord. Use us for your glory, your honor, and your praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.